Welcome to the Trellix Spotlight series. My name is Nick and I will be your host. Today's session will focus on protecting against entry vector threats. This webinar will be recorded. If you prefer not to participate in the recorded session, please feel free to disconnect at this time. A link to today's recorded presentation will be emailed to all registered attendees. This webinar is a brief overview covering common use cases and scenarios regarding this topic. It is not intended to be all-encompassing. If assistance is needed, please contact Trellix Technical Support. If you have questions during the webinar, please type them in the Q&A window. This webinar may run longer or shorter based on your participation, and we recommend asking as many questions as you can to make the most of this series. If the Q&A window is not displayed, click the tab at the bottom of your session window and click on the Q&A icon. We will answer the questions during the final section of this webinar. If you experience any audio issues during the webcast, please drop and attempt to reconnect. Our speaker today is Sean Campbell. Sean is an advanced malware technical support engineer that has over 20 years of experience working with malware. Sean helps deliver quality assistance with implementation of best practices for threat remediation and propagation prevention. Sean works directly with Trellix Labs and malware support to help facilitate, conduct root cause analysis, and determine a solution. Sean offers malware guidance and coaching to support teams around the world. Ladies and gentlemen, Sean. Thanks, Nick. I want to welcome everyone to another Trellix Spotlight series where we'll be looking at entry vector threats today. First on the agenda, we'll look at common entry vectors, which will consist of email, web, direct access, and other. From there, then we'll take a look at various types of entry vector threats along with their attack flow. Once we conclude with the attack flow, we'll then look at commonly used MITRE attack techniques used in entry vector attacks, along with the more common MITRE techniques and how these map to an overall ENS strategic approach. This will then take us into specific countermeasures under prevention and recommendation. We will then conclude with additional recommendations and a QA session. But first up, let's go and take a look at common entry vectors. First up on common entry vectors is going to be email. First one we're going to look at under email is going to be phishing. Phishing is a technique that uses spam, instant messaging, or text to deceive people into disclosing credit card numbers, bank account information, social security numbers, passwords, or other insensitive information. Internet scammers use email bait to fish for passwords and financial data from internet users. Some common phishing attacks are going to be email phishing, which is going to be the more prevalent, spear phishing, welling, smishing, and or vishing. Next up under email is going to be spam. Spam is an unwanted electronic message, most commonly unsolicited bulk email. Typically, spam is sent to multiple recipients who do not ask to receive it. Types include email spam, instant messaging spam, web search engine spam, spam in blogs, and mobile phone messaging spam. Spam includes legitimate advertisements, misleading advertisements, and phishing messages designed to trick recipients into giving up personal and or financial information. Some examples of spams are going to be hoaxes, advertising, extortion or money scams, or even chain letters. Next up, faker malicious links. In this case, it's malicious emails that contain links to malicious software downloads or to a website that mimics a real company site mainly targeting financial sites in order to steal private information such as passwords, account numbers, social security numbers, and so on. Some examples of fake or malicious links are going to be phishing links for credential theft, spoofed websites, or next stage downloaders, droppers, or exploits. Next up under email is going to be malicious attachments or files. In this case, it's malicious attachments is sent electronically, generally from an unknown sender. Some examples of malicious attachments are going to be spear phishing attachments such as Agent Tesla, Cobalt Strike Attacks, Emotet, APT ransomware campaigns, and more. Last under email is going to be spoofing. Spoofing is the creation of email messages sent to deceive recipients by delivering from a forged or fake email address. In the case of spoofing, this encompasses all different email vectors, which consist of spishing, spam, faker malicious links, or malicious attachments or files. Moving right along, let's go and look at web. So the first one we're going to look at for web is going to be browser exploits. In this case, browser exploits are malicious code that takes advantage of a flaw or a vulnerability through the victim's web browser to carry out some form of malicious intent. 
Some examples of browser exploits are going to be Google Chrome, Microsoft Edge Zero Days, Drive-By Downloads, Exploit Kits, iframe Injections, Man-in-the-Middle Attacks, and so on. Browser DNS Redirect. This is a method used to direct someone or something to a different place than it was originally intended. Cyber criminals can use these to route legitimate websites traffic to a counterfeit website. In the case of browser DNS redirect, some examples are going to be browser and DNS hijacking, Chrome redirector virus, DNS changer, and more. Next for web, we're going to look at malware hosting websites. Here, Malware hosting websites are malicious websites that attempt to install malware or other unwanted programs on your system. These websites are considered dangerous because they exploit browser vulnerabilities or send spyware and other unwanted software to users. Some examples here are going to be malvertising, botnet networks, emotech campaigns, as well as ransomware campaigns and more. The next vector we're looking at is direct access. Here, we're going to see removable media infected devices. Basically, in this case, this is malware that is effectively utilized removable media to eliminate the physical gap between the internet and internal networks. Some examples for removable media infected devices are going to be auto runs, Stuxnet, boot sector, or MVR viruses. And last but not least, let's go ahead and take a look at other. The first up under other is going to be social engineering. This is the act of manipulating people into performing actions or divulging confidential information. It relies on human interactions, such as trying to gain the confidence of someone through trickery or deception for information gathering, fraud, or computer system access. This can take many forms, both online and offline. Social engineering techniques commonly cross into other vectors, such as phishing, email, redirects, web, and so on. Some examples for social engineering techniques are going to be spear, spear phishing attacks, quid pro quo, or pretexting. And last but not least for our entry vectors, let's look at rogue hacking. Rogue hacking is a defiant person or group who uses computers to gain unauthorized access to data or networks in order to commit illegal acts. In the case of rogue, hack, rogue hacking, this encompasses most vectors for hacktivism, notoriety, and or financial gain. Okay, so next up, let's go ahead and look at some different threats that fall under those entry vectors that we just looked at in the previous slide. Here, we're going to look at five different types of entry vector threats, and we're going to look at their entire attack chain. And then once we get to the prevention and recommendation steps, then we're going to look at some of those very first stages, and we're going to try to block those with different countermeasures. So the first one that we're going to look at here is going to be phishing, which is going to be a malicious file. In this case, the threat actor used email to deliver a weaponized document file for initial access, which is minor technique phishing malicious file. Next, the threat actor used the weaponized document file with appealing file name to, loser, to lure the user in for execution, which utilizes user execution minor technique T1102. The next step, the threat actor used a weaponized document file to drop a PE file, which was a Cobalt Strike beacon for command and control. In this case, the threat actor used Ingress Tool Transfer, which is Technique T1105. Next up, the threat actor used a scheduled task to launch the Cobalt Strike implant every 15 minutes for persistence. In this case, the minor technique utilized is Scheduled Task or Job, Scheduled task, which is modern technique T1053005. The threat actor then used Cobalt Strike implant for establishing HTTP network connections for command and control. Here it used application layer protocol web protocols. The threat actor then used the uh, Cobalt Strike implant to launch PowerShell encoded commands for defense evasion. In this case, it uses command and scripting interpreter PowerShell. The threat actor then used Cobalt Strike to implant and run IP config for discovery. Here, it uses, utilizes modern techniques, remote system discovery, as well as command and script interpreter Windows Command Shell. And last but not least, for this particular attack, the threat actor used Cobalt Strike implant to inject into system processes for defense evasion 
which is miter technique process injection. So now let's go and take a look at another phishing attack, but in this case, we're going to look at malicious link. So here, what we're seeing is for initial access, the threat actor used emails with malicious hyperlinks to OneDrive for that initial access. In this case, the modern techniques utilized are phishing, spear phishing link, as well as user execution, malicious link, and ingress tool transfer. Second stage, threat actor used a zipped ISO file to distribute bizarre loader malware for defense evasion. Here it utilizes modern techniques, subvert trust controls, mark of the web bypass. Third stage, the threat actor used an LNK file and an ISO file to lure users for execution. Here what they utilize is going to be user execution malicious file, as well as subvert, subvert trust controls and mark of the web bypass. For the next stage, the threat actor used utilized run DLL32 to execute a DLL payload for defense evasion. Next stage, Bizarre Loader used bits admin command line callbacks for persistence. In this case, it's going to use Miter Technique's bits job as well as signed binary proxy execution run DLL32. Bizarre Loader uses a well known set of net.exe and nltest.exe commands for discovery. Bizarre Loader used HTTP protocol to download Cobalt Strike Beacon DLL file for command and control. In the next stage, the threat actor used process injection into Edge browser to launch Cobalt Strike post exploitation task for defense evasion. Here it utilizes MITRE techniques, process injection, remote system discovery, as well as signed binary proxy execution run DLL32. In the case of the next stage, the threat actor used Cobalt Strike to execute IP config and net user commands for discovery. In the next stage, the threat actor used Cobalt Strike to execute a well known ad find recon script for discovery. Here it utilizes MITRE techniques, signed binary proxy execution run DLL32, as well as command and script interpreter Windows, script, Windows command shell and system network configuration discovery, domain trust discovery, as well as masquerading. In the next stage, the threat actor used a command batch script to dump SAM, security, and system registry hives via reg.exe for credential access. Modern techniques utilized here are security count manager, as well as command and scripting interpreter Windows command shell. Next, the threat actor used more.com command line tool to access web browser internal files for credential access. Here they utilize uh, modern techniques, credentials from web browser, as well as command and script interpreter Windows command shell. The next stage, the threat actor used Rubius for credential access. Here they're using techniques steal or forge Kerberos tickets, Kerberosting as well as steal or forge Kerberosing tickets, ASP rep roasting, and command script interpreter Windows command shell. The threat actor used multiple systems utilities for discovery. Here it's utilizing system network configuration discovery. Next, the threat actor used PowerShell and CMD to install any desk for persistence. The techniques utilized here are going to be application layer protocol, web protocol, command and scripting interpreter PowerShell, remote access software, as well as command and scripting interpreter Windows command shell. The next stage, we're going to look at lateral movements. So for lateral movements, the threat actor used RDP to install FileZilla for exfiltration. Here, the threat actor used Task Manager to dump LSAS process for credential access. Techniques utilized are going to be remote services, RDP, as well as OS credential dumping. The threat actor used web, web, web browser to upload LSAS dump file to cloud storage by, uh, for exfiltration. Here it's using exfiltration over web services, which is exfiltration to cloud services. Next, the threat actor used RDP to download and execute portable versions of advanced IP scanner for discovery. Techniques utilized are remote services, remote desktop protocol, 
as well as Ingress tool transfer and network service for scanning. Threat actor then utilize MSSQL UDPS scanner, MSQL tool for discovery, which utilizes network service scanning. The threat actor then used a well-known batch file called kill.bat to inhibit system recovery for impact. The modern techniques utilized here, impair defenses, disable or modify tools, as well as inhibit system recovery. And last but not least, the threat actor uses RDP to execute ransomware binary manually on the target systems for impact. The modern techniques utilized here are data encrypted for impact, as well as defacement, internal defacement, and last, remote services, RDP. For our third entry vector threat, we're going to take a look at browser exploit. So in this case, the threat actor used an exploit on a vulnerable component of a public facing application to drop a malicious DLL for initial access. In this case, the modern technique utilized its exploit public facing application. The second stage, the threat actor used an exploit on public facing application to execute an encoded PowerShell command for execution. Here, the modern techniques utilize your exploitation for client execution, command and script interpreter PowerShell, command and script interpreter Windows command shell, as well as exploit public facing application. For the third stage, the threat actor used an encoded PowerShell command for dropping additional artifacts for command and control. The techniques utilized are going to be command and script interpreter PowerShell, impaired defenses, disable or modify tools, obfuscated files or information, ingress tool transfer, as well as application layer protocols, web protocols. For the fourth stage, the threat actor used CertUtil via PowerShell to download additional artifacts for command and control. Modern techniques utilized are going to be command and scripting interpreter PowerShell, ingress tool transfer, as well as application layer protocol, web protocol. And last but not least, on browser exploit, the threat actor used PowerShell to run the ransomware binary file for impact and the encryption routine. Moving right along, let's go and take a look at our fourth entry vector, which is going to be drive-by compromise. So in this case, the threat actor used SEO, search engine optimization poison, to lure users for initial access. The modern techniques utilized are drive-by compromise as well as ingress tool transfer. For the second stage, the threat actor used compromise installers to lure users for execution. The modern technique utilized is user execution malicious file. So for the third stage, the threat actor used Visual Basic scripts to launch a DOS command batch file for command for execution. For the fourth stage, the threat actor used DOS command or batch files to disable Windows Defender via multiple reg.exe and sketchtask.exe for defense evasion. The techniques utilized are impair defense, disable or modify tools, as well as modify registry. So for the next stage, the threat actor used anti-AV, which is an open source tool obfuscation tool to obfuscate malware binary for defense evasion. The modern techniques utilized are going to de-obfuscate decode files or information, as well as command and script interpreter Windows command shell. The next stage, the threat actor used command to launch Raccoon Info Stealer for execution, which utilizes command and script interpreter Windows command shell. For the next stage, malware uses HTTP to download additional tools for command and control. The modern techniques utilized here are going to be application layer protocols, web protocols, as well as ingress tool transfer. In the next stage, the malware used native APIs to access Chrome credentials stored for credential access. The modern techniques utilize credentials from password stores, credential from web browser, as well as native API. In the next stage, the malware used uh, malware used SQLite DLL to read Firefox credentials stored for credential access. Here, the modern techniques utilize are credentials from password stores, credentials from web browsers. Next, malware used unconfirmed methods to create a zip file for collection, which utilizes modern technique archive collected data. 
In the next stage, malware uses cloud storage for exfiltration. The minor techniques utilized here, exfiltration over web services, which is exfiltration to cloud storage. And last but not least, malware uses command delayed command execution to delete itself for defense evasion. The minor techniques utilized in this case are going to be indicator removal on host file deletion, as well as command and script interpreter Windows command shell. For our fifth entry vector threat, we're going to go and take a look at web shell. So in this case, a threat actor used exploits against IAS in Microsoft Exchange Server to install China Chopper web shells for persistence. The minor techniques utilized are going to be server software component web shell, as well as exploit uh, public facing application. For the next stage, the threat actor uses NL test net and other basic commands via China, China Chopper web shell for discovery. The techniques utilized here are going to be server software component web shell, command and script interpreter Windows command shell, system network connections discovery, system information discovery, permission groups discovery, domain groups, as well as domain trust discovery. The next stage, the threat actor used WMIC via China Chopper web shell to list running processes for discovery. The minor techniques utilized are going to be server software component web shell, command and script interpreter Windows command shell, Windows management instrumentation, instrumentation WMI, as well as process discovery. For the next stage, the threat actor used proc dump 64 via China Chopper web shell for credential access. The minor tech techniques utilized here are going to be server software component web shell command and scripting interpreter Windows command shell, as well as OS credential dumping via LSAS memory. The next stage, the threat actor used PowerShell to establish additional C2 channels for command and control. The modern techniques utilized are going to be command and script interpreter web shell, server software component web shell, as well as non-application layer protocol and application layer protocol web protocol. For the sixth stage, the threat actor used MSI exec via China Chopper web shell to execute web payload for command and control. The techniques utilized are going to be server software component web shell, system binary proxy execution MSI exec, application layer protocol web protocols, as well as ingress tool transfer. And for the next stage, the threat actor used command delete commands by China Chopper web shell to delete web shell files for defense evasion. The minor techniques utilized are server software components web shell, command and scripting interpreter web shell or Windows command shell, as well as indicator removal on host, which is file deletion. And last but not least, the threat actor used net group delete commands via China Chopper web shell to delete active directory groups for impact. Here, we, they utilize uh, modern techniques, server software components web shell, command and scripting interpreter Windows command shell, as well as account access removal. Now that we've looked at some common entry vectors as well as some common entry vector threats, let's go ahead and actually map those out to different modern techniques utilized. So first up, we're going to look at seven different tactics. So the tech, seven tactics we're going to look at are going to be initial access, which is the adversary is trying to get into your network. Execution, running a malicious code. Persistence, maintaining their foothold in your environment. Defense evasion, avoid being detected. Credential access, the adversary is trying to steal account names and passwords. Lateral movement, move through your environment, as well as command and control, which is communicate with compromised systems to control them. Now, what you'll see is a, different, uh, a number of different techniques below the tactics here. We're going to focus in more on the ones that are actually in yellow. So, what we saw in previous ones I put in here, and I've also put some of the more common ones that I've seen with running entry vector threats. So what we're going to do is we're going to actually map out the ENS strategic approach utilizing some of these different tactics and techniques. The ones we're going to focus in on are going to be phishing, command and scripting interpreter, scheduled task job, 
user execution, WMI. For persistence, we're going to look at boot or log on auto start execution, as well as scheduled task or job, which also falls under execution. For defense evasion, we're going to look at deobfuscate, decode files or information, impaired defenses, masquerading, modifying registry, obfuscated files or information, process injection, as well as system binary proxy execution. For credential access, we're going to look at OS credential dumping. For lateral movement, we're going to look at lateral tool transfer as well as remote services. And last, we're going to look at command and control. And the ones that we're going to look at there are going to be application layer protocol as well as Ingress tool transfer. Now let's go ahead and take a look at an ENS strategic approach. So in this case, what we're going to do is we're going to look at the MITRE techniques we focused in on the previous slide, and we're going to map those to an ENS overall strategic approach and what components block these di different types of techniques. So in the case, uh, the first case, we're going to look at phishing here. Basically with phishing, adversaries may send phishing messages to gain access to victim systems. All forms of phishing are electronically delivered social engineering attacks. Phishing can be uh, targeted, known as spear, spear phishing. In spear phishing, a specific individual, company, or industry will be targeted by the adversary. So when it comes to ENS coverage, what we see here is ENS firewall protects for phishing, web control, as well as adaptive threat protection. The next one we're going to look at is command and script interpreters. So here, adversaries may abuse command and script interpreters to execute commands, scripts, or binaries. In the case of ENS coverage, what we have here is access protection, exploit prevention, dynamic application containment, as well as adaptive threat protection on the far right. The next one we're looking at is going to be at, uh, exploitation for client execution. Here, adversaries may exploit software vulnerabilities in client applications to execute code. When it comes to ENS coverage, what we see here is exploit prevention, as well as adaptive threat protection. Next up, schedule task or job. In this case, adversaries may abuse task scheduling functionality to facilitate initial or recurrent execution of malicious code. What we see for coverage here is going to be access protection, as well as dynamic application containment, and ENS adaptive threat protection. Next up, user execution. In this case, an adversary may rely upon specific actions by a user in order to gain execution. Users may be subjected to social engineering to get them to execute malicious code. For example, opening a malicious document file or a link. When we're looking at coverage for ENS, what we see here is all the way across the board. We have access protection. We have exploit prevention coverage, dynamic application containment coverage, ENS firewall, as well as web control, and ENS adaptive threat protection. The next technique that we're looking at here is Windows Management Instrumentation, WMI. Here, adversaries may abuse WMI to execute malicious commands and payloads. So when we're looking at specific protection when it comes to WMI, what we'll see here is exploit prevention, ENS firewall, as well as adaptive threat protection. Next technique is going to be boot or log on auto start execution. In this case, adversaries may configure system settings to automatically execute a program during system boot or log on to maintain persistence or gain higher level privileges on compromised systems. When it comes to ENS coverage, what we'll see here is ENS access protection, ENS exploit prevention, as well as ENS adaptive threat protection. Second from the bottom, we're looking at deobfuscate decode files or information. Adversaries may use obfuscated files or information to hide artifacts of an intrusion from analysis. ENS coverage here is going to be adaptive threat protection. And last but not least on this particular side is impaired defenses. So in this case, uh, basically an adversary may maliciously modify components of a victim environment in order to hinder or disable defense mechanisms. This is not only involves impairing preventative defenses such as firewalls and antivirus, but also detection capabilities that defenders can use to audit activity and identify malicious behavior. 
ENS provides coverage here for access protection, exploit prevention, dynamic application containment, as well as adaptive threat protection. So moving right along, the next one we're going to look at is masquerading. So masquerading, adversaries may attempt to manipulate features of their artifacts to make them appear legitimate or benign to users and or security tools. Masquerading occurs when the name or location of an object, legitimate or malicious, is manipulated or abused for the sake of evading defenses and observation. In the case of ENS coverage, what we have here is exploit prevention, dynamic application containment, as well as ENS adaptive threat protection. The next technique that we're going to look at is going to be modify registry. In this case, adversaries may interact with the Windows registry to hide configuration information within registry keys, remove information as part of a clean a cleanup, or as part of other techniques to aid in persistence and execution. When it comes to ENS coverage, what we see here is dynamic application containment, as well as ATP adaptive threat protection. The next technique, obfuscated files or information. In this case, the adversaries may attempt to make an executable or file difficult to discover or analyze by encrypting, encoding, or otherwise obfuscating its contents on the system or while it's in transit. This is common behavior that can be used across different platforms and the network to evade defenses. So when it comes to this protection with ENS, what we see here is we see adaptive threat protection. The next technique we're going to look at is process injection. Here, adversaries may inject code into processes in order to evade process-based defenses as well as possibly elevate privileges. Protection with uh, process injection from ENS is going to come from access protection, exploit prevention, dynamic application containment, as well as adaptive threat protection. The next technique, system binary proxy execution. Here, adversaries may bypass process and or signature-based defenses by proxy and execution of malicious content with signed binaries. For protection, what we see here is ENS exploit prevention as well as adaptive threat protection. Modern technique, OS credential dumping. Adversaries may attempt to dump credentials to obtain account logon and credential material, normally in the form of hash or clear text password from an operating system and software. Credentials can then be used to perform lateral movements and access restricted information. Coverage that we see the NS provides in this case is going to be access protection, exploit prevention, dynamic application containment, as well as adaptive threat protection. Second from the bottom, we're looking at lateral tool transfer now. Adversaries may transfer tools or other files between systems in a compromised environment. Once brought into the victim environment, files may then be copied from one system to another to stage adversary tools or other files over the course of the operation. NS provides coverage with access protection, dynamic application containment, as well as adaptive threat protection. And last but not least on this particular page, remote services. Here, adversaries may use valid accounts to log into a service specifically de designed to accept remote connections such as Telnet, SSH, and or VNC. The adversary may then perform actions as the logged on user. Different coverage that ENS provide in this case would be access protection, firewall. And last but not least, let's look at the last uh, four techniques that we see here. So the first one up is going to be application layer protocol. Here, adversaries may communicate using application layer protocols to avoid detection, network filtering by blending in with existing traffic. Commands to the remote system and often the result of those commands will be embedded within the protocol traffic between the client and the server. Protection provided by ENS is going to be firewall web control, as well as adaptive threat protection. Next up, Ingress tool transfer. So in this case, Ingress tool transfer, adversaries may transfer tools or other files from an external system into a compromised environment. When it comes to coverage here, we see ENS web control, as well as adaptive threat protection. Next on the list is going to be non-standard port. 
Here, adversaries may communicate using a protocol and port pairing that are typically not associated. For example, HTTPS over port 8088 or port 58 or 587, as opposed to the traditional port 443. Adversaries may make changes to the standard port used by a protocol to bypass filtering or muddle analysis parsing of network data. When it comes to protection on non-standard port here, we see access protection, exploit prevention, as well as firewall. And last but not least, web services. So in the case of web services, adversaries may use an existing legitimate external web service as a means for relying data to and or from a compromised system. When it comes to ENS coverage, what we see here is ENS access protection, ENS exploit prevention, ENS firewall, ENS web control, as well as ENS adaptive threat protection. Now that we've looked at an overall ENS strategic approach, let's go and take a look at prevention and recommendation. In this chapter, what we're going to look at is different countermeasures of ENS, as well as components that you can utilize to block entry vector threats and their payload. In this case, what we're going to look at first is adaptive threat protection. Here, adaptive threat protection uses rules to determine which action to take based on multiple data points, such as reputations, local intelligence, and or contextual information. These ATP rules can be managed individually. So the first rule that we're seeing here is going to be rule four, which is use GTI file reputation to identify trusted or malicious files. Rule four util utilizes uh, MITRE techniques, which is user execution. It determines if a file is trusted or malicious based upon the file's GTI reputation. Rule five, use GTI URL reputation to identify trusted or malicious processes. This rule is related to MITRE technique user execution. The rule determines if a process is trusted or malicious based on the GTI URL reputation. Rule 239, identify suspicious command parameter execution. This rule is related to MITRE technique command and script interpreters. The rule identifies the suspicious execution of an application through command line parameters. Rule 251, identify files that Web Gateway reports as suspicious. In this case, the rule is utilized to identify files that Web Gateway reports as no malicious or most likely malicious and issues a most likely malicious reputation. Rule 255, detect potentially obfuscated command line parameters. This is related to MITRE technique obfuscated files or information, which is a defense evasion tactic. This rule is designed to analyze command line parameters passed to programs to alert on potentially obfuscated strings that could indicate malicious behavior. Rule 256, detect use of long encoded command PowerShell. This rule is related to MITRE technique command and script interpreters. This rule is designed to look for suspicious usage of the encoded command option in PowerShell. Malware can use this technique to evade static detection of command line parameters. Rule 257, detect potentially uh, malicious usage of WMI. In this case, the rules related to MITRE technique Windows Management Instrumentation, WMI. This rule looks for common usage of WMI to either execute code, move laterally, or persistence. Next up, rule 260, which is detect AMZ bypass techniques. This rule is related to MITRE technique impair defenses, which is a, another defense evasion tactic. This rule determines if a file is trusted or malicious based upon the file's GTI reputation. Rule 263, detect processing, accessing, detect processes accessing suspicious URLs. This rule is related to MITRE technique user execution once again. The rule is designed to prevent different techniques used to bypass anti-malware scan interface, better known as AMSI. Rule 269, detect potentially malicious usage of WMI service to achieve persistence. This is related to minor technique WMI. The rule looks for common usage of WMI service to execute code and set up persistence. Rule 300, prevent office applications from starting child processes that can execute script commands. Rule 300 is related to MITRE technique, phishing, spear phishing attachments. 
This is better utilized uh, to prevent Office applications from launching child processes that can execute scripts like PowerShell and CScript. Rule 301 blocks command.exe from being spawned by Office application. This is related to minor technique phishing once again, as well as command and script interpreters. Rule 301 is designed to prevent any Office application from launching command.exe. Next up, Rule 304, prevent browsers from launching dual use tools such as script editors and command. And last but not least on this particular slide, Rule 310, prevent email app applications from launching child processes that can execute script commands. This is related to minor technique user execution. The rule is designed to prevent email programs from launching processes that can execute script commands. And for the last slide for uh, NS Adaptive Threat Protection, we see four rules. First rule up here is Rule 322, which is prevent MSHTA from being launched by any process for all rule group assignments. This rule is related to modern technique system binary proxy execution, which is another defensive evasion tactic. This rule prevents MSHTA from being used as a signed binary to proxy code execution through. Rule 323, prevent MSHTA from being launched as a child process. This is related to modern technique 12118, which attackers can use MSHTA to execute malicious HTML files, JavaScript, and or VB script. Second to the last, Rule 324, prevent MSHTA from launching suspicious processes. This rule is related to modern technique uh, 1218, which is prevent MSH from launching suspicious applications. This rule takes a more aggressive approach to the preventing code execute via MSHTA and as a such is in observed mode by default, which is the rule directly above it. And last but not least, Rule 325 identifies suspicious payloads invoking Run DLL 32 process. This rule is designed to identify suspicious payloads proxy, proxy and code execution through Run DLL 32 process. Now that we've looked at AP, ATP, let's go ahead and take a look at dynamic application containment. Dynamic application containment is a component of ATP designed to block or log unsafe actions of an application based on containment rules. Some of the more common rules that are actually violated with entry vector threats are going to be allocating memory in another process, creating files with a bad extension, creating files with an XE extension, as well as job extension and VBS extension, executing any child processes, modifying portable executable files, modifying startup registry locations, modifying the service registry location, modifying the Windows firewall policy, reading from another process memory, suspending a process, and last but not least, writing to another process memory. Next up, let's go and take a look at on-access scan anti-malware scan interface. In this case, you can, you can configure the on-access scanner to integrate with AMSI, which is a generic interface standard provided by Microsoft and supported on Windows 10, Windows Server 2016, and newer operating systems. AMSI allows applications and services to integrate with threat prevention, providing better protection against malware. Integrating with AMSI provides enhanced scanning for threats in non-browser-based scripts such as PowerShell, WScript, and CScript. By default, AMSI integration is in observed mode. AMSI scanning events report malicious scripts to the server, but no action is taken. Disable observed mode to actively block these threats. Now that we've looked at AMSI, let's go ahead and take a look at ENS exploit prevention. So the first signature we're going to look at here is new startup creation. This signature is related to modern technique, boot or log on auto start execution, registry run key startup folder. This event indicates that a new program has been designated to run at startup or that the startup status of an existing program has been modified. The next signature, 6073, execution policy bypass in PowerShell. This is related to modern technique command and script interpreter. This event indicates an attempt to execute PowerShell core, PowerShell.exe, when the execution policy by bypass parameter is utilized. Signature 6087, 
PowerShell command restriction encoded command. This is related to command and script interpreter MITRE technique. This event indicates an attempt to execute PowerShell core, PowerShell.exe, with an encoded command parameter. Signature 6107, MS Word trying to execute unwanted programs. This is related to MITRE technique user execution. This event indicates an attempt to execute CMD, PowerShell.exe, or MSHTA by MS Word. Next signature, 6108, which is suspicious download string script execution. This is related to command and script interpreter, MITRE technique. This event indicates that Windows PowerShell is used for downloading and executing suspicious scripts. Next signature, 6109, PowerShell suspicious WMI script execution. This related to uh, MITRE technique, command and script interpreter, as well as WMI MITRE technique. This event indicates that Windows PowerShell is used for executing suspicious scripts. Signature 6112, MS Outlook trying to execute unwanted programs. This is related to MITRE technique user execution. This event indicates an attempt to execute CMD, PowerShell.exe, or MSHTA by MS Outlook. Second to the bottom, signature 6113, file is threat reflective self-injection. This is related to MITRE technique command and script interpreter once again. This event indicates a file attacked where a PowerShell script tried to inject a portable executable into the PowerShell process itself. And last exploit prevention signature on this one is 6114, which is file is threat reflective exe self-injection. This is once again related to MITRE technique command and script interpreter. This event indicates a file attack where PowerShell script tried to inject an executable into the PowerShell process itself. So moving right along, next signature we're looking at is going to be signature 6121, which is file is threat shell code self-injection. This is related to MITRE technique process injection. This event indicates a file attack where a PowerShell script attempt to inject and execute malicious shell code into the PowerShell process itself. Signature 6125, Java remote shell code injection. It's related to technique process injection. This event indicates a JavaScript attempt to inject and execute malicious shell code. Next signature is 6131, which is weaponized OLE object via WMI. This is related to the WMI MITRE technique. This event indicates an attempt to access WMI through Word, Excel, or PowerPoint using macros. Using WMI, the attacker can execute some other executable like PowerShell or, Will or WScript from WMI PRVSC. Next signature we're looking at is 6163, which is suspicious behavior, malicious shell code injection detected. This is related to MITRE technique process injection. This event indicates an attempt to inject a potentially malicious shell code into a legitimate process using remote thread by which an attacker can execute malicious code on the user system. Next signature is 6207, which is attack service reduction, file download attempt by script. This rule targets the attempt to, the attempt to download uh, malicious scripts from the web. Signature 6217, execute policy bypass in, w, in PWSH. This is related to MITRE technique command and script interpreter. This event indicates an attempt to execute PowerShell core PWSH when the execution policy bypass parameter is used. Next up, signature 6224, PWSH, command restriction, encoded command. Once again, this is related to the command and script interpreter MITRE technique, and this event indicates an attempt to execute PowerShell core PWSH with the encoded command parameter. And last but not least, are signature 8003, which is a file is threat, suspicious PowerShell behavior detected, and signature 8004, file is threat, malicious PowerShell behavior detected. Both signatures are related to command and script interpreter and indicates malicious activity through PowerShell. Now that we've taken a look at exploit prevention rules, let's go and take a look at the expert rules. So when it comes to expert rules, these are created to prevent buffer overflow and illegal API use, the exploits, and to protect files, registry keys, 
registry values, processes, and services. In this case, it's an enhanced expert level rule that uh, that supersedes rule ID 6107, MS Word trying to execute uh, um, one of programs. This particular rule is added protection for threats that execute other programs that are not covered by signature 6107. If you implement this expert rule, you should disable exploit prevention signature 6107. So last but not least, let's take a look at ENS access protection rules, which in this case, we're going to look at default rules. So the first rule, browsers launching programs from downloaded program files folder. In this case, it's protecting from MITRE techniques, user execution, malicious link, malicious file. Create new executable files in program folders, as well as create new executable files in Windows folder. In the case of both these rules, this is for lateral tool transfer, MITRE technique, P1570. Execute and Mimikatz malware. In this case, it's for OS credential dumping, and it can be anywhere from LSAS memory to support account manager, which we saw earlier, NTDS, cache domain credentials. Next up, executing scripts by Windows scripting host. Once again, we're looking at command and script interpreter MITRE techniques here, which can be anywhere from PowerShell to VB to Command Shell to JavaScript. And last but not least, registering of programs to auto runs. Here, we're looking at MITRE technique boot or log on auto start execution. Now that we've looked at prevention and recommendation, let's go and take a look at some additional recommendations to defend against entry vector threats. So first up, implement a security awareness program. Provide regular security awareness training for every member of your organization so they can avoid phishing and other social engineering attacks. Conduct regular drills and tests to be sure that training is being observed. Back up your data. The best way to avoid the threat of being locked out of your critical files is to ensure that you always have backup copies of them, preferably in the cloud or on an external hard drive. Secure your backups. In this case, make sure your backup data is not accessible for modification or deletion from the system where the data resides. Use security software and keep it up to date. Make sure all your computers and devices are protected with comprehensive security software and keep all your software up to date. Make sure you update your device software early and often as patches for flaws are typically included in each update. Practice safe surfing. Be careful where you click. Don't respond to emails and text messages from people you don't know and only download applications from trusted sources. This is important since malware authors often use social engineering to try to get you to install dangerous files. Only use secure networks. So in this case, avoid using public Wi-Fi networks since many of them are not secure and cyber criminals can snoop on your internet usage. Instead, consider installing a VPN which provides you with secure connections to the internet no matter where you go. And stay informed. Keep current on the latest threats so you know what to look for. Next up, use mail and web gateway products that identify and block access to malicious links. Use anti-spam and anti-phishing filter solutions to block emails with suspicious links, attachments, and or trusted senders. Prevent PowerShell from running on systems in which PowerShell isn't intended to run. Make sure that Microsoft Office security policies for macros are set to high or very high. Block emails with password protected zip files. And with that said, I'll go ahead and pass it over to Nick and we'll go into a QA session. Thank you for everyone attending. Thanks, Sean. As a reminder for everyone, Trellix Education Services offers exceptional training to go along with our award-winning products. If you would like to learn more, please visit the website listed on your screen to see all of our offerings. Now let's get our Q&A session started. I see we have several questions, but it's not too late to add your question. Please type it in the Q&A window to submit. Additionally, take a moment to fill out the survey. Your feedback and suggestions are always appreciated. For access protection and exploit prevention rules that monitor the same behavior, uh, like creating a new startup entry, is there any benefit from enabling both rule types? Uh, yeah, there actually would be, uh, and, and it kind of goes two ways. So when you come to access protection, 
the thing about access protection rules is you're only as good as you know whenever the, the product was actually developed and that rule was actually developed so as techniques change as os architecture change with rules like exploit prevention and JTI, for instance, they can actually get updated on a fly with a new content change. So a lot of them will either get deprecated, they'll get modified for like less falses for new techniques or you know new OS architecture uh, directory structure. So really, when when you're talking about AP rules, they may be a little bit outdated when you have some of these newer things. Where the exploit prevention rules, once you implement those, they could add more techniques in the architecture, the directory structures for whatever the auto, like we're talking about, like auto runs, for instance. Uh, if there's anything that changes between one OS to the next, anything new comes out, they can update that. So there would be some overlapping. However, with uh, exploit prevention, it would be a more, much more robust. Uh, Detection and it would add new techniques and new directory structures and whatnot. So you could utilize both, but I would be more prone to utilize the exploit prevention one just because the content would be newer with new TTPs and uh, you know and newer uh, malware campaigns that are coming out. Got it. Okay, perfect. Thank you for that one. Uh, when new uh, exploit prevention content rules are downloaded, what's the best way to determine which one should be enabled or reported? Um, I'm kind of a stickler for like whatever is whatever by default is and then you know you go ahead and enable it for risk assessment and risk analysis so a lot of these newer rules that come out like for instance uh, you saw me add some of the new PowerShell core rules and this came from the latest February exploit prevention content release where we don't just do only PowerShell.exe now we actually add you know the actual the P, uh, PWSH process as well so there are newer rules Generally speaking, when new rules come out, they're always going to set them to default just because, you know, we can get the, the false prone rate and then we can start making modifications based upon that. So when you see new, like older rules that are updated and it says, you know, this rule's been minimized for falses uh, or there's some wording uh, similar to that, those would actually be more prone to actually be enabled. But anything new coming out, especially with something like as aggressive as like PowerShell, for instance, I would personally suggest a report on anything before implement it in your environment, just not cause any type of business interruption. Uh, for other rules that do come out that are enabled by default, those are usually ones that are really mature and we've actually broke down the false prone by making different inclusions and exclusions based upon, you know, the data we receive from the field and, uh, you know, as, as well as QA. So me personally, if a new rule comes out and it's set to disable by default, I would set it to uh, report and just kind of watch it. Uh, you know, over time, usually what I'll do is like push outs, maybe like an IT team or something like that. Uh, just a team that you can get feedback on and it's easier to get data from that particular team uh, and push out to a small subset group. You know, look at it for a little while. If there's really not any falses, uh, then go push it out to another group and kind of start monitoring and look and see if there is any falses because, you know, depending on the rule, some can be way more aggressive than others. So. I kind of like just going to the report mode and then kind of gauging it by looking at my environment and looking at the different events come back. And if I'm seeing just really good data uh, versus falses, then you might want to implement the rule at that point in time. Got it. Okay, perfect. Thank you for that. It looks like that's all the time we had for today's session. I want to thank everyone for joining today's webinar and a big thank you to our presenter, Sean. As a reminder, a link to today's recorded presentation will be emailed to all registered attendees. This concludes today's webinar. Stay safe, everyone.